So, um, good evening and welcome. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I just want to um, welcome you and just um, say a few words about the Rouse Visiting Artist Program because tonight is really, this is the, at least originally envisaged as the first of the, this year's Rouse Visiting Artist Program. We've had this uh, particular program here at the GST since 1987. And the purpose of the, the Ross Visiting Artist Program is basically to bring uh, practicing artists to um, the school to, for a lecture, to spend some time, to be part of a studio. And uh, this has been going on in various forms since 1987. Um, over the last few years, there have been a number of uh, people, for example, Marina Abramovich, uh, Robert Wilson, and many others have come under the rubric of this uh, Rouse Visiting Artist Program. Uh, this year, uh, with uh, Chantal and Ben's help, we've had this wonderful poster that you have seen, which is, uh, it's, I, I hope it's everywhere, and sort of like that. And uh, I think we are trying to make sure that everyone is much more aware of this particular program. Many of the people who've come have worked uh, with the school, uh, with, uh, we have also this, uh, this um, sensory media platform. Many of the people have worked with the sensory media platform. So there's been a lot of interaction. And over the next uh, few weeks, um, apart from uh, Jonathan and uh, Kirsten, who are going to talk together tonight, we'll have Scott Pask, who is a set designer who's done the latest uh, thing at, AR at ART, Richard Tuttle, Vijay Ayer, Chuck Hoberman, Calvin Klein, Paolo Antonelli, and uh, Frederick Mal, presenting different kinds of um, topics that um, rely on the idea of us defining artistic intervention a little bit more broadly uh, than we would. And I think that's also an exciting uh, experiment uh, that is happening this year. So we welcome any thoughts or suggestions that you have for next semester of people that could come to the school and could be part of this particular program. I'm very um, happy that we have now, with um, Chantal's uh, innovative thinking, a, a kind of uh, unusual uh, double act, uh, which is different than the originally advertised program. And I think it's going to be uh, just as exciting as what was originally planned, if not more so, because the two individuals involved, at least for the presentation part, then we'll have the, 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 the threesome for with, uh, with David joining as well um, as part of the discussion. But um, we have arranged for the two friends to actually introduce each other. As you know, Kirsten is teaching here at an option studio. And Jonathan has been connected with the school quite a bit over the last few years. So I think uh, who you are going to introduce Kirsten. Yes. So please welcome Kirsten, who's going to introduce Jonathan. Thank you. Well, um, I'm going to keep it quite short, of course, um, because there's already two lectures going on. Uh, so let me introduce Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Olivares. In fact, uh, Jonathan and David and myself, we don't know each other that long, uh, a few years now. And uh, we got to know each other because Jonathan approached us um, exactly in relationship to this little book, uh, which is called Source Material. Uh, which he did together with Jasper Morrison and uh, Bilardi. Mm. Now, when we got to know each other and we went uh, over the phone through our kind of shared stories and we realized that both our office and, and uh, Jonathan likes pretty much this material um, and this city, uh, we, in some ways, we realized that uh, we had much more in common than we ever thought. So, Jonathan originally uh, educated at Pratt Institute and actually uh, from Boston himself, moved to Los Angeles not so long ago in order to um, engage further in his um, 
industrial design. And what we, I mean, and David and myself not being completely foreign to industrial design ourselves, what we very much appreciated with the work of Jonathan and here on the right, you see a, a very beautiful piece of furniture of his indirect dialogue with the super box of, um, of uh, Sotsas in an exhibition which we designed in Los Angeles last year uh, called Small Museum for the American Metaphor. Now, what we felt was so specific about Jonathan, I would say rare in uh, industrial design today, is that he's still part of this tradition of industrial designers who actually understand how to make material, how to think uh, the technology of industrial design. And pretty much, especially in Belgium and Holland, industrial design became something like a collage of easy ideas. And Jonathan, and that's the last picture I show, actually from uh, our office where you see these very shiny uh, versions of, of his own chair. Um, Jonathan is one of these rare designers today, of course in the tradition of Grigic, for who he worked, um, who, who tries to use uh, design or producing techniques in order to make uh, pieces of very peculiar furniture, which do not necessarily, uh, I would say, uh, immediately answer to uh, what's fashionable today, but tries to transcend that. Of course, he makes much more. Uh, you know, he's involved in different kind of, uh, I would say, mediators, even on on on, on the internet, and, and how you would uh, kind of um, kind of steer decisions on design, but I'm sure he will talk about that. But what we remember is exactly this. Uh, and so for me, it's a pleasure to, to introduce him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I think these, these kind of uh, overlapping interests and friendships that happen uh, as one practices and, and kind of gets to know uh, those people who are practicing that one likes these these are uh, these are kind of very motivating I think they kind of push uh, electrify the process a little bit and uh, you get excited for these shared um, shared friendships and I think that I mean that that sort of leads into you in, a, in some ways why um, why I sort of moved from Boston to Los Angeles which was now uh, three years ago and uh, this is a picture um, taken by Marco Villardi, who was the third author in the book Source Material, um, when he was visiting Los Angeles to work with my office on a project. And we, I think what, what brings me to this city, um, which, um, which is such a kind of exciting place to practice industrial design, is the, 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 the dual nature of the city, which is the, on the one hand, it's a very industrial place. So I can, as a, as a furniture industrial designer, I can really make things. I can I have factories, I have lots of factories. I can find them quickly and easily. Um, and they can help me through that prototyping process and they can guide the physical model making process. Um, on the other hand, there's a, there's a, large, there's a, a strong connection to natural landscapes. So I think it's in furniture. It's it's. Um, I mean, I I've tended to work on outdoor related pieces of furniture, but on the other hand, you want you want a kind of um, a con contextual stimulation. I think that it's it's in industrial design. Unlike architecture, you don't have a uh, the client is is an abstraction. It's a kind of bigger. It's an idea. It's a it's a, um, a kind of group of people, uh, an abstract group of people who might like to sit at a cafe or, or um, a bench, a group of people that might need a bench. It's never a, an individual who has an opinion. Um, closest you get to an opinion are the marketing people inside of a company, which are, you know, questionable. Um, so the first project I want to talk about, it was my first project um, out of school. Um, and, and it was a project where I wanted to, um, I had a, my first client, which was an Italian company in Milan called Danese. And they have a, a rich history of, of some very strong kind of small uh, accessory-like products. And I wanted to um, engage that, that legacy with an idea of, of activity. Somehow I felt 
something missing from from furniture from from design was the notion that people use things and that that happens in a, in over time um, and so these images of McQueen uh, Steve McQueen taken by William Claxton at the Sherry Netherlands Hotel in New York these were the driving kind of factor for this first product that I would develop and I thought wouldn't it be interesting that rather than develop a kind of um, a thing which you can identify and which is locked that somehow that thing would would question or invoke more action or more uh, decision making and even maybe some motion on the part of the user and so here what I liked so much is that McQueen he turns this very kind of uh, even 19th century uh, interior into a, a place of activity and action as he kind of turns the race car or turns the chair into a race car and uh, ultimately uh, the last photos uh, he crashes and falls out of the chair. Um, and so somehow um, this, uh, uh, you know, after about a year of work, this is what resulted. And, and I, I can't really tell you what it is. And I think that I'd still leave that vague. Um, some people call it a cart. Others call it a stool. Um, on the manufacturer's website, it's sold under the label multi-purpose storage. Um, the, the thinking was, could we take a bunch of objects and sort of put them together into one, and, and that somehow that lack of definition would enable uh, the user to kind of take it upon themselves to then decide what that thing is. Um, and so the, the, uh, the object is built out of folded sheet metal, um, which is a very basic economical material. You basically make a pattern, almost like a dress pattern, and that, that gets cut out, and then someone else folds it. And then it, we, we use rivets to pop the thing together, which um, in a way mirrored my own prototyping process, which was cardboard and rivets. Um, and so I was able to very quickly make a series of models and sort of uh, cut, cut all of the details. Um, and so in the end, the, you see that the proportions or the negative space in the object actually allow it to attach onto a table and extend the functionality of a typical dining table. And, I, and this is sort of mm, aware of this idea that somehow a lot of people are working from home today and that the dining table needs to behave a little bit more like an office sometimes. Um, and then finally, um, this is taken by an Italian photographer, Giovanna Silva, in her apartment. And somehow um, I, I scratched her floor while I was staying there once. And so as a present, I gave her a smith. Um, and then when we were redoing uh, my office's website, I asked her to contribute a photograph of the smith in her house. And she sent this without knowing anything about the, the William Claxton, Steve McQueen images. Um, and I actually just made this connection preparing this lecture that somehow the final photo was which Giovanna took has so much in common with those photos of McQueen. Um, and you can see the kind of motion and, and activity that this object uh, encourages. Um, this, this next project is, is somehow um, connected in a way um, in the sense that it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a museum space. Um, it's a, a library or a learning center. So it's also a workspace and it's also a space where people had to um, behave themselves in a certain way. Um, and so together with the curators uh, of the museum, this is the Nouveau Musée National in Monaco. Um, together with the museum's curators, we, we established a, a kind of educational program that would involve plants from the museum's garden and books uh, selected by the, the uh, curators of the museum. And we had to sort of come up with a framework to house this. And the first uh, renderings or, or kind of models made the space look a bit like a storage closet. And we really wanted to have a lot of stuff in this room. And finally, um, together with the museum's curators, we were able to edit down uh, the content for this room and, and the furnishings to a way that we had the analogy that the room should somehow behave like a blog. And this was in 2011. So somehow that idea uh, felt very relevant as a lot of the content uh, that we were getting about art was coming through the web. And so you have in this space, we created this framework which has you know space for news. Uh, like every good blog, it has an about section um, right here. Um, oh, sorry. And so the space, it was, it was a kind of, what I like about it is it was more of a framework and it was a very specific type of furniture that ultimately comes back down 
to the creation of one detail, which is sort of a metaphor for the whole space in itself, is this one cast aluminum detail that brings elements together, bringing these uh, profiles together. Um, and, and I think that, in a way, mirrors the purpose of the room, which was one space that brings together students and uh, educators and visiting guests and artists and, and lecturers um, to the museum. And so I, I like the idea of thinking of framework outside of the typical context of, or rather furniture, outside of the context of what is a typical piece of furniture. So this frame um, is a very, it's not a known typology. In fact, it, it had no purpose other than it being a graphic purpose. And I think the exaggeration of that is what, um, what worked very well for us. Um, here we have the, the first real industrial project that I've worked on. The, other, the first two projects we looked at, we could call them semi-industrial in the sense that there's no investment made into the making of the product. You can laser cut something. You can do it once, twice, or a thousand times. Um, but here, this is the uh, aluminum chair, which I developed for the Knoll um, in New York City. And they... Um, they, you know, they have a long legacy of, of design. There's some of their benches on up there, and these are null products down here. And so it's a, it's a very um, weighty uh, con a company and context to go into. And uh, they are very industrial. They will make thousands of something. And so they need to create the tools that will help them to make those thousands uh, effectively, economically, and so on. And so we, when they asked, when we, our relationship evolved out of uh, first a research project about office chairs, and then it, the design director basically posed this question of, well, let's make something physical, and then came the the, the challenge of, well, what could I propose? I mean, it could have been a, a coffee table or a, or a cabinet or. Uh, any kinds of uh, products that they sell. They sell so many different things. And I chose uh, specifically to work in seating because I thought it was the most challenging area to actually do something that, that um, could push us or guide us towards what the future of seating uh, could be or what it might look like. And so the choice became, uh, before we actually said, let's design a chair and this or that material, that we, we posed a series of questions to ourselves. And those were, how could you kind of reinvent or readdress the typology of an outdoor chair. And if you look at outdoor seating, you, you have two varieties. You have metal chairs, which are usually, usually made out of flat um, or bone-like structures. And then you have plastic chairs, which are organic, very comfortable, but they deteriorate under the sun. And so we, we wanted to kind of find a, a hybrid of something, you know, technological middle ground, um, so to speak. And so working with a number of suppliers um, and eventually choosing one who could actually mold a skin in, in aluminum, uh, which is technically a very challenging thing to do and something that has only, had only previously been done in, in car engines, uh, not at the scale of furniture. And so this is a section um, of the chair which shows you the, the thickness, which is a three millimeter thickness that uh, gives the chair its comfort and its weight. And you know, working with a manufacturer like Knoll, it's a, it's a wonderful um, process where you have a few years to really flush out an idea. And so these are, you know, these are studies for the rear leg joint, which is where most of the, uh, let's say the rear leg, the backrest and the seat all intersect. So it's a, structurally, it's a very uh, challenging place. It's one of the most fragile places Places in the chair, so it had to be very strong, and at the same time express, um, let's say, the, the language of the chair and deal with stacking and so on. So this was a kind of drawn-out process of a few years of of, of perfecting the stacking, and we actually. Um, Technically, we, we invented something that the furniture industry hadn't found yet, which uh, was the stacking rail. It's, a, it's kind of a, in, in, as far as furniture goes, it's a very banal detail, but most stacking chairs have to have a bumper under the chair, and usually these are pre-made large rubber components that get screwed to the underside of the chair, so as you stack them, um, they don't scratch each other. And uh, these things are very visible. Uh, when you look at the chair on the ground, you'll, you, you would see these large bumpers sort of hanging out under the seat of the chair. So we, we were looking at, incident, at, at skateboard rails, which are these sort of plastic rails which go on, on the underside of 1980s skateboards. And we developed that into 
um, this sort of uh, nylon fitting that goes uh, is screwed to the underside of the chair and at the same time keep follows the profile of the chair and also prevents the side of the chair from being scratched. I mean, these are really, um, in a way, banal problems, but these are the problems that result in, in uh, let's say, Facebook returning 200 out of 300 chairs that they purchased from you. So it's a really um, important detail. I think the details, in a way, um, they make the product. I think Eames said that. He said the details are not details, they make the product. And um, I, told, I couldn't agree more. So the chair, it's, it's generally painted. Um, but um, and in many different colors, uh, paint is very uh, resistant to abrasion, and it also reflects some of the light off of the chair, so it stays relatively cool. Um, but after discovering our uh, kind of shared love of polished aluminum, uh, we made this series um, for Kirsten and David's office in Brussels, and uh, we're still Noel is still investigating how to put this into a larger scale production. But again, the problem is oxidation. Um, exposed aluminum oxidizes outdoors and if you would put this outdoors which the chair is generally meant for it, you could probably cook an egg on it so I, I, the chairs came to uh, Brussels with a warning saying you know keep these indoors um, and this is actually the exhibition of the catalog which Kirsten showed earlier, um, the source material exhibition. It was done uh, for Kaleidoscope Gallery in Milan and eventually moved to v the Vitro Design Museum in, uh, in Weil am Rhein, Germany, outside of Basel. And this is the, uh, the, the way we sort of displayed these objects because it wasn't only um, you know, a few. There were over 60 objects from 60 different people, from art to architecture to cooking to um, we had uh, some designers, but we tried to keep it as, as wide as possible. And the, the thinking was that, you know, if, if each of these people have a kind of stepping stone. Uh, I, we, the idea got started when I was, I was at um, Richard Sapper's office in Milan, who's a, for those of you who don't know, he, he's a great industrial designer responsible for the IBM and Lenovo ThinkPads, um, the Lassie espresso maker. He's 82 years old. And... Um, I was meeting with him in Milan, and, and we, we in his house slash studio, and he had on his desk um, a, a stone, an axe head, which is, he thinks, you know, many, many thousands of years old. I mean, this is a, a kind of prehistoric axe head, and it's been in his family for a number of years. And actually, it was so so precious to him that he didn't even lend it to us for the exhibition, um, and he gave us a book instead. But this this object sort of got us thinking that there are these objects that people keep on their desks that somehow mean a great deal to their process, or they're like creative, they're like stepping stones for the creative mind. Um, and so we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to gather these these objects, these kind of modern day artifacts, which are each each are a layer in our kind of material world. Um, and so we have uh, the kind of roll of text of uh, leather here is uh, from Jean Tuitou, the founder of APC. And um, here we have uh, Thomas Demand's pencil sharpener. Uh, the designers Bless gave us a wooden Coke bottle from, um, from that they found in Africa. It's a kind of roadside trinket or tourist object. Um, in the rear, you see this sewing machine, uh, for, which belongs to Erwan Borlak, um, that his, his, uh, he's, he would steal from his mother as a child and sort of learn how to sew. Um, and so th this was an interesting, I mean, I think the exhibition design also presented its own set of problems, which was how do you sort of safeguard these objects yet allow people to view them in a natural way. And so the, the kind of waist height or counter height uh, pedestals, um, mostly in glass, uh, seemed a natural fit to the problem. And so this, this incidentally, this leads into, oh, actually in the rear here, you can see the pink skateboard rails, which were the inspiration. You can see them in the reflection of Kirsten and David's block of aluminum. These are the, the plastic skateboard rails which informed the aluminum chair that I just showed. So we kind of um, contributed, Jasper insisted that we contributed to our own, we contribute to our own exhibition. Um, so that, that, that was held at the Vitra Design Museum, which is here on Vitra's campus. And that was, in many ways, a lead-in uh, to a collaboration with Vitra that my office has now um, had for the last year and a half. And it's an ongoing collaboration. Um, and what, this next project I'll show just opened in June. 
And um, it is actually, the, to the right here, you see the Vitro Design Museum designed by Frank Gehry in 1989. Well, this building was um, a kind of bait, uh, in a sense, because first they asked Frank to develop the factory, which you see in the, in the rear. But the factory wasn't interesting enough to, for Frank to take on as a commission. So when they threw in the prospect of doing a design museum, he, he was very excited by that and did both. So you have this um, you know, very expressive uh, museum. And, and, and the factory also has very expressive stairwells. Um, but aside from those stairwells on the corner, that building might as well be like an anonymous factory block in Burbank. It's like white stucco. Um, and so we inherited the second floor of this building. Um, which is a, a tw roughly a 20,000 square foot um, uh, production hall that uh, formerly, up until about a year ago, was served as IT offices and uh, storage space, and it was subdivided into about 15 smaller rooms. And Vitra um, contacted my office and uh, London-based architect Pernilla Orsted and sort of put us together to think about what the future of their office um, communication could be like. So they, they had just completed the Vitra house by Herzog and Dumuron, which showcases their like residential objects. And so as a result, um, you, had, you had this, uh, lack of, of how they showcase their office products, which is actually their largest product category. Um, Vitra is roughly, I think, 70% their office business. And so um, with this building, what, what we did was we sort of, we, we kept it very much open, um, but we divided it into two areas, a sort of open concrete area and a wooden platform. And these house two very different groups of furniture within the uh, office portfolio. Um, another thing we did was, was uh, we, we liked the idea that somehow the space should be a planning tool or a learning tool, not only for the visitor, but also for Vitra to learn and plan on their own after the space would be open. And so um, everything in the space is functional. Typically, you have uh, furniture on display, like on a pedestal or on a shelf that, that has three tiers of shelving, and, and you can't access any of it. And so what we did was to say that rather than use shelving, we would use functional tables. And so this is like a 30-meter-long um, a 35 meter long uh, wooden table, which serves as a display surface, but we also then place outlets at it so that visitors to the showroom who include, you know, corporate, uh, let's say the, the president of a corporation or uh, an architect who's planning an office, when they visit this space, sometimes they're given tours, but other times they're left on their own. So they might, you know, need to recharge something and they can sit at this, at this table. Another thing we did was we implemented a two by two meter grid across the entire floor, which is painted on in the same kind of paint that you find on factory floors. And what this grid does is it spatially allows someone to plan their office. So if they say, we have a we have a 10 meter by by 13 meter space that we're working on, they can sort of immediately gauge what the furniture that they're looking at is in relation to their space back home. Um, and this was the, the floor marker. Um, you know, the, the idea of mixing chairs is an interesting thing. You, you want to have, uh, rather than standardize a space with, with hundreds of chairs, there's a very interesting idea from Christopher Alexander in a pattern language about uh, mixed chairs or diverse chairs, and that somehow, and I think that's a, a philosophy that Vitra as a company has really embraced, so we, we continued that. Um, these are. This is the end of that bar, uh, and ends with a kitchen counter. And what we've did, if you, if you, I'm sure all of you have had the experience of being in a record store and sifting through posters, um, or even an art museum bookshop. They have this kind of poster rack. So we did a poster rack um, for Vitra for about a hundred and hundred of Vitra's, uh, what they call references, which are offices that they've furnished throughout the world. So you can look at, um, you know, let's say Google headquarters or or a, a Deutsche Bank uh, headquarters while you're making your coffee. And so we tried to mix a lot of media into the space. The space is really almost like um, in the hi hybrid of information, uh, media, and, and architecture, a very light uh, architecture, in fact. So the, we spent the majority of our budget refurbishing this uh, light well, which was made out of fiberglass and had completely deteriorated and yellowed over the years. So we restored that to its um, original glory. Um, you know, we bring the light down with these uh, scrims, and then you know there's information hanging, 
Um, office chairs, it's a funny, I mean, this seems like a, like a silly, or maybe to architects it's a, a funny or lesser uh, problem, but somehow uh, when companies sell office chairs, there's a group of about 10 people that come in for what's called a sit test. And usually the chairs are displayed in a circle so everyone's facing each other. Everyone then sits down in the chairs, and of course there's some women in, in, in dresses or skirts, and everyone's sitting down facing each other and expected to sort of rock back and forth uh, <laughs> testing this chair out. And, and there, it's really a ridiculous spectacle. Yeah, it's, it's not a respectable way to kind of look or engage at a, at, a, at a piece of furniture, not to mention that the office chair is always in relationship to a desk. So you always think about the, in furniture, it's always the, the next larger relationship which is oftentimes the most important relationship. And the office chair's next larger relationship is a desk. So how could you possibly expect people to test and decide on a chair if there's no table um, as a prop? And so our reference was a kind of ballerina bar um, that you find in dance studios. And this, this very thin, it's, it's about 11 inches deep, um, this thin bar groups the chairs together, kind of unites them spatially, but also saves you from the embarrassing uh, kind of circular exercise class um, and, and gives a reference of the, of the table height for the arm. Um, Vitra, it was interesting mining through Vitra's existing showrooms. They tend to hide things or, or think that certain elements are important for certain audiences. So in their old showroom, the components of office furniture were hid in these slick closets that were only pulled out for, what, for what's called a facility manager or the kind of person who's in charge of the nuts and bolts of putting together the furniture on site. And we thought, let's celebrate this almost as if in a museum of natural history because we thought it would be equally interesting to the CEO. Um, Another uh, large media installation, we hired uh, an architectural photographer, uh, Daniela Anside, to uh, travel to three for offices which were recently furnished by Vitra. Um, one is the G-Star headquarters by OMA, another is uh, the Vitra Design Museum offices by Konstantin Gurchich, and the third is a Savile Peach designed office on Vitra's headquarters. And we took these photos, blew them up at full scale, and put them on a revolving billboard. So this billboard has three sides and changes every two minutes. So that forms a backdrop to the office system. So as people are coming into the space, we, we refrained from any kind of heavy styling and instead really showed the furniture against this real life uh, backdrop. Um, another wonderful thing about this factory or this showroom is that it borders the factory where they produce the Eames aluminum group. So you can see um, in this photo you see have this view of this window and this is the close-up view through the window and you can see that the only intervention we had here was to um, was to drop this um, this LED text which explains uh, in German, the very kind of uh, exciting things that are happening below in the factory. So how many steps are involved in the production process of the aluminum group? There's 13 steps. How many bolts are used? How many screws are used? How many workers? What the production time is for each chair? And it's a very captivating sort of five minutes in, in German. And, and the interesting thing was that we wrote the text in English and sent it to Vitra. And they, of course, translated it into Swiss German or Swiss German. And then somehow, uh, they forgot that they had the original English text, so they translated it back to English. And, and, and I saw this the first time last week, um, and, and you have this wonderful sort of uh, uh, ESL, uh, Swiss-German English, uh, giving you the tour of the factory, which I think is fantastic, because anyway, you're in Germany, and if the factory would talk, that's probably how, how it would. Um. And the final piece of content we developed uh, for the showroom is called an office perspective, and it it shows 150 years of um, the of evolution of the office. So everything from monuments and floor plans to great buildings that were built to furniture pieces to office equipment. Um, and, and this is meant as a kind of end note to the showroom uh, to, to inform both Vitra's staff and also uh, visitors uh, who might be curious about where things are going. Interestingly enough, you see a lot of things repeat. Like today, people are very afraid of open plan offices, but you see that this was done in the 1960s and before that in the 1920s, and you can understand what the reactions were to those things. And, and, and all of this sort of helps in the planning process for, we could say, tomorrow's office. Um, the last project I want to show is the most recent project, um, which was just launched in the last couple of months. Um, a few 
you know, I think that my office spends, we spend a lot of time doing research and writing projects on top of the industrial design and spatial projects. And I always view this as a window into um, the outside world. And in a way, um, oftentimes these things that we might write, they come back to, to haunt us. So this is an example. Um, we, I wrote an article for Domus in 2013 about the, uh, let's say, the um, opportunities or uh, advancements taking place in, ma in the manufacture of buildings. And my hypothesis was that if we would go out and, and we would meet some of these, the, the architects, and so I think we interviewed Tom Main and, and Stephen Hall and um, Richard Meyer, all, people with very different approaches towards how they manufacture their buildings. And, and the idea was within that manufacturing world, we might find something that we could take back into the scale of furniture. Um, and we, we did uh, with this company called Zaner, which is based in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. And they um, have developed over the years an extrusion, a aluminum extrusion, which acts as a, let's say, curvable light frame construction. And they first pioneered this technique um, or this, this typology, uh, which is you see here in these bins, working on on Frank Gehry's uh, music project in Seattle. And, and since then, this has become a real business for them. They make a lot of buildings using this technique, you know, some by fantastic architects that you love and some by architects you've never heard of. But they're, they're, nevertheless, their shop is very busy with this. And so they, after reading the article, they contacted me and asked if, if we could somehow collaborate at the scale of furniture, which is what the conclusion of the article implied. <clears throat> and so, you know, contrary to working with a company like Knoll, where it takes three years uh, to do something, they have their own, Zayner has their own factory. And so we were able to work at a, a pace that is really unprecedented uh, with any of the other manufacturers I've worked with. And so we built this prototype of a bench in two months. Um, basically, it, it takes the 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 form or the, uh, the the primary structural element behind these buildings, which you actually see in their factory uh, here vertically, and these th th this uh, extrusion, we we just flipped it on its on its end and put it horizontally, and that as the extrusion can be rolled to any shape, you could therefore potentially have any bench shape. Um, and so we made the first prototypes, and, and that for me as a designer, I, I was kind of content. <laughs> we had a, we had a, a, an object, um, but for them as a manufacturer, that was only the beginning of a process, which was much more exciting than the the, the let's say the one bench shape, and that was the development of a web tool, um, which they they call Shop Floor. And in that web tool, uh, a designer architect can log on to this platform and using these points, uh, manipulate and control or load pre-shaped benches. And so imagine you had a terrace, which was, I don't know, 80 feet diameter uh, or a rotunda or a garden with a slight curve. You could then log on and, and make exactly the curve or the shape uh, that you would need. Or even if it's a straight length and you need it to be 17 and a half feet, you can do that. And, and you, are, the, you can see that it gives you real-time pricing. Um, and you're able to, to save it and upload it, and it goes right to the factory. Uh, and so we, we debuted this bench and the software um, in Chicago in June, and we commissioned immediately sort of knowing that the bench would be subject to shapes made by any number of, of, of interesting uh, architects or designers. Um, I, for the exhibition, I wanted to open up the shape making to someone else. So we invited a typographer uh, or a graphic designer, Nathan Antelique, to, do, to develop this alphabet of possible um, bench shapes. And, um, and so we think we got about 23 different shapes and possibilities. Um, so that's all um, in my, in my uh, little talk. So I, I guess now I'll shift to, uh, to introducing um, Kirsten Gears and David Van Severin. Um, so like Kirsten said, we, we had the chance to meet a few years ago, um, but I had known their work uh, for much longer than that. Um, uh, I began following their practice while I was still a student, um, I, and I remember in 2003, their first project, Entrance, um, which was uh, basically the entrance to a notary's office, a very humble, humble project, but a very beautiful project as well. And the interesting thing about this project is that it became a kind of manifesto for their office and actually was their first collaboration, which brought them together um, as a team. And it's it's maybe, perhaps you'll see it later, but it's a kind of windowless space where they used uh, mirrored and semi-opaque glass to create a very bright um, environment and a very um, 
uh, yeah, I think visually, formally very beautiful environment. Um, another another project a uh, favorite of mine of theirs is their weekend house from 2012, which took a kind of typical Belgian row house, and uh, and, and the, from what I understand, there was a kind of um, a main house and then a, a plot um, sort of behind the house, which was to be used. And rather than than uh, use the main house, they sort of flipped it around and said, well, let's 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 have people let's have the 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 client live in this extended area. And so there they developed these four, uh, let's say identical, but each unique spaces where you have a pool, a garden, um, a living room and a courtyard. And I think the amazing thing there is, which you see in a lot of their work, is the, the economy of material. Um, they, they work with very basic materials. You oftentimes see brick and cinder block um, or concrete. Um, but then at the same time, there's a reinvention or a, a kind of a twist of that material, um, which is either static, very strong, or um, in, in some cases, they'll, they'll, I remember a project, uh, an, an office building with concrete panels, and they were standard concrete panels where there wasn't much budget, but somehow they figured out that they could, they could cut holes and reliefs in these concrete panels. And so it's a real working of, of I think, in furniture, we have this... Uh, proximity to materials and, and building and understanding of materials. And I, I think it's rare that you see such a, such a kind of um, in-depth uh, working of the material and understanding of the material in work as with theirs. So um, I give the podium to um, Kirsten and David. Hello. Hello. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Well, what, what, what was perhaps originally announced as a as a single lecture, the fifth of November, became a double lecture, and now somehow a triple lecture. So you know, uh, there's no more people coming. I think. <laughs> uh, however, it would have been bizarre to to have one person talking and the other one sitting and approving or disapproving <laughs> with the argument. So um, here we go. Of course, talking in the context uh, of uh, this dialogue with um, uh, Jonathan, um, for us is also special because it could give us at least a slight uh, focus. Uh, I mean, we thought, let's talk about interiors. Let's not talk about whatever we do. Let's, of course, talk about different buildings. But let's use uh, the very particular way Jonathan uh, deals with his own uh, profession with his own work um, and uh, connect that to how we uh, think our work. So, of course, when you talk about interiors, you talk about architecture, and here's, of course, a good example. It's not our work, it's a picture by Bas Prinsen, a photographer uh, we almost always work with, uh, of a building somewhere in Houston. And that building, in many ways, is um, used by BAS often in relationship to this, which is a, a project of 2007, no, 2005 even, uh, which is a border crossing of ourselves, and where in many ways uh, the reflection of this kind of uh, nondescript green uh, you all of a sudden see uh, parallel with the horizon is somehow repeated uh, in this um, border crossing garden, this oasis, uh, this interior, you could say. Where, in the end, perhaps the interior is that what we are after, but the, the device we use to make it is, of course, this adobe wall. This idea that whatever you make uh, as an architect often uh, is, is localized, is uh, there found on the very edge, uh, on the border there where you me mediate the perimeter, one could say, has always been a big fascination for us. So here you see um, an Arish, um, kind of um, perimeter as you could find them in the 1950s in Dubai and which in many ways inspired um, a set of um, small pavilions which we designed uh, in Sarja uh, two years ago for the biennial where in a way the Arish itself of course uh, of palm leaf uh, and the very effect of this Arish it's kind of um, I would say um, slight uh, diffusion uh, is here represented by this uh, steel curtain. In many ways, this, this idea of interior is, of course, always about the space it creates and then the way you measure that. And this um, 
Edrache painting with the pencil here slightly bit too big in its representation on the beamer uh, is very much about uh, one to one scale pencil and the word space which seems to be uh, you know as big as the tableau uh, the frame allows uh, and it's exactly this mediation of measuring that what you in a way cannot entirely measure uh, which we feel uh, we try to bring back in many of these projects so you see this here but David will explain this project later, uh, where in a way the interior needs a few devices uh, to, to organize it and to measure it. At the same time, of course, um, it is ultimately uh, about an oblique strategy. I would like to say that here, and also that project will come back, uh, it is about the confetti on the floor, uh, which is only the result of the other intervention, uh, but where perhaps the confetti inspires the title, uh, in this case, after the party in the Biennale in 2008. The confetti one could compare uh, with uh, this, and this is one of the many examples of a Baldessari um, collage-like painting, a crowd with shape of reason missing, where ultimately it's that what organizes, uh, in this case the crowd, here taken away by Baldessari, which starts to get a certain form. And it's the form of the architecture uh, which makes whatever uh, life which unfolds through it uh, possible. So, first project. Um, this is a, a Giardini in Venice. Um, we were invited in, or actually we won a competition in 2008 to do the Belgian pavilion, the one you see as a white cutout. It's uh, standing in the Giardini uh, on the big axis towards the Italian pavilion. But it's also the second pavilion built in the Giardini. In 1907 it was built after the big Italian pavilion. So in 2008 it just missed its 100th birthday. And um, that for um, the question in the, in the, this is actually the pavilion, the question in the competition was to think about that, that fact, and also about the idea that there is a pavilion being changed over time, rebuilt a bit, extra decorated, taken away decorations, and so on, becoming gradually a white box for, for exhibitions. So just space for these endless biennales happening there. So what about when you do an architecture biennale in general, what about that, how, how, how could you show space? And that was also our question. How could you almost see space as, as something that exists one-to-one -one and is just not uh, a representation of it? And our intervention, and maybe that's something that reconnects to what Kerstin showed, but also to what Jonathan showed, is, is, is it's something about making a new frame, making a reframing of what is existing to have you look in a different way to it. The, 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 the idea of scale is important. So uh, the, the, the story of, let's say, the, the, the desk's chair, the desk being the next step, maybe the long bench still existing, but then space as such uh, we deal with is our task, you could say. And, and this is uh, the Belgian pavilion for 2008. And actually entirely blocking off the, the existing pavilion, standing as a, as a big box in the Giardini, leaning on a path in this very strange metallic wall surrounding it. And the metallic wall is actually, it looks like a volume from, from the outside, but actually it's just making a, a frame around the existing building, almost showing the, new, uh, the old building within a new courtyard, and is, is designed as a building as such. It's made out of a very um, beautiful scaffolding. Italian scaffolding is more beautiful than any other. Um, and, and, and we really took uh, that design very serious in the sense that each module of the scaffolding became actually the, the, the walking boards became the, the floorboard, uh, the, 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 I mean the facade boards, and each of the modules became made uh, this as a, as a project. Uh, uh, almost, we didn't want it to look as super temporary, but actually as something that could be there forever. 
and at the same time became a device to be able to stand stable for, for three months, but also to walk through because it had a certain width and to reframe, as you can see, it on itself a new condition of space. So you would enter the, 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 the Belgian pavilion through a corridor to then actually find just space as such. And here again, maybe the chairs was for us an important thing. So these were the existing spaces since you entered, actually. And now I have to go back. I don't know which one that is. Yeah, just quickly to the plan. Here, you would enter on, and there's a pointer, yes, uh, through this corridor in the back of the pavilion to just find empty spaces as such. And then, and, 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 and find confetti on the floor and some scattered shares. Confetti, again. And to suddenly discover that this big box you walked in is actually a thin wall surrounding the existing pavilion, blocking off its main entrance. And actually in the circus, which is a biennale, creating kind of an oasis of silence where the party is just over after the party. The confetti lays on the floor and the chairs just stand there. You could just have a seat and uh, take a, a rest in the sun. And maybe one last thing about the confetti. For us it was a very also pragmatic tool to cover evenly the, the floor inside and outside uh, in the new Belgian Pavilion for 2008, and it gave immediately the title to the project after the party. Of course, and uh, we're trying to show through six projects, I mean, a bit in relationship to what Jonathan was talking about before, um, this relationship we have with um, an architecture which is designed, you say, from inside out. Uh, whereas in the Belgian pavilion you need to build a wall around the building to kind of recognize and to see the quality of um, the inner spaces. You take away the villum, you show the inside and the outside spaces in an equal way. Um, if we design houses, and we design a few and we only want to show actually a series of two here, um, we're very much uh, obsessed with similar trains of thoughts. This specific house, a house close to Brussels in Buchenhout, uh, you could say is a, a typical example of a house as you can find it in Belgium uh, and also elsewhere, of course, uh, on a small lot, essentially, a lot which is not much bigger than the house itself. So here you see the lot and the house is the white uh, kind of rectangle, um, which despite the fact that it's there squeezed in between other houses, it very much likes to celebrate its idea of living on its own in the middle of nowhere. Now, perhaps the clients, as we had them, were a bit lucky in the sense that there was an agriculture area before and there's something like a small wood in the back. Still, uh, this idea that when you try to live in a place very much uh, that the way you live in it is based on this, I would say, this fiction uh, you create for yourself, we thought was very interesting. So from that perspective, we thought uh, designing this house for these people who actually came from the city of Brussels and wanted to stay here and already wanted to ignore the existence of their neighbors the moment they arrived there, um, uh, we thought it was perhaps interesting to, to rethink the position, you could say, of the fence. Whereas typically on a small plot like that, there's a fence and then in Belgium there's a rule you cannot build the first four meters from the fence on both sides. And then you have a house which is roughly this size and then you have perhaps a car parked here and a garden in the back. We thought that rearranging a set of these, I would say, a priori ideas could help them, uh, imagining them uh, not to be where they were actually at that very moment. So uh, what we did is we, we moved the fence uh, to close to the house. We added, we stretched it to the maximum we could imagine. In a way, gave up the rest of the land or made them arrive around the house, not exactly in front of it, and kind of try to design a house symmetrical as if it would, sorry, uh, as if it would uh, be on another spot. So where the door is not uh, here in the front, but in this side or on that side, and where the house itself was essentially built up as a set of equal rooms, you can see them here, nine of them, uh, all in a kind of enfilade relationship, one with the other. So you have a house, you have two courts, 
uh, and you have this set of rooms. So the space in between, since it's of course, uh, I mean, it's owned by, by the people who live there, becomes some kind of weird free haven, uh, a kind of self-created wilderness, where of course things happen, but the things uh, which they do not really take care of. So you have here the actual fence of the house on the left, the house itself, and then the border with the neighbor. And in between, the wildflowers, which grow a few times in a year, um, as a kind of self-created wilderness. From inside, um, context totally disappears. The house itself is built as a very, in a way, simple construction. It's a kind of a cinder brick um, ground floor, uh, very mineral and painted white. I mean, the house is relatively cheap, actually quite cheap. Um, it has this kind of uh, concrete uh, kind of flooring and concrete uh, kind of roof material, like these big uh, standardized beams, steel doors. Um, uh, on the second floor, um, a wooden uh, soup construction. So the house itself, as I was mentioning, is a set of uh, kind of rooms of four by four meter, where on the mineral floor, on the ground floor, you have in a way the kitchen and something like a living room. You could say a summer house, very open, very mineral, with very big uh, sliding doors. Um, a lot of open rooms, uh, spaces which are used in summer, but are somehow covered and used for storage, as you can see here too, uh, even like with an outside shower. Now, normally the window here is in front and it's glide, uh, I mean, it's, it's here in front of their storage. And on top, a construction which is maybe the closest uh, comparable to a roof structure made out of uh, balloon frame wood um, in the insulation and then a kind of uh, roof material, this kind of bitumen, uh, uh, very carefully put. So again, the top floor, as you can see, um, it mimics the plan of the ground floor, has the same kind of logic, but purely because of the different use of material. Here you see that same plan, but there the balloon frame, it becomes a very different house. You could say a winter house as opposed to the summer house below. So here you see a kind of picture of winter and summer house together on the left, uh, on the ground floor, on the right, on the top. So it is essentially a house which I would say creates its own kind of comfort uh, with the simple means which are available to it. As you can see, the consequence of the plan, as you saw earlier, uh, is that even the bathrooms, as you can see here, inhabit a room similar to the others. So there's a very strange, I would say, um, suggestion of flexibility through an extremely rigid plan. So, of course, and that's perhaps another argument here, um, trying to renegotiate a plan of a house, not so much through its functionalist uh, logic, but through an uh, kind of a search for a simple spatial essence, uh, which allows you to use, uh, according to the orientation, the spaces as they are available. So the detailing both of the ground floor and the top floor, uh, and the way each of the consequences, for example, of the fact that uh, both uh, floors have the same height, but there's thicknesses, thicknesses of the table of the first floor, uh, thicknesses of the different openings and so forth, uh, create these subtle differences uh, which make the house uh, a house full of uh, kind of particularities. So here you see the house again. It's the other side, and you see also that uh, details as windows um, are put all, uh, I mean, as additions to a certain extent to the inside. So these windows, uh, they're as big as the openings. Uh, when they're open, they slightly stick out of the volume of the house so that you don't see them again. So ultimately a house, you could say, designed from the interior proper. So the next uh, project is also a house, actually. Um, but a very different one, Jonathan was already mentioning, is called the Weekend House. Uh, it's in Merchtem, a bit of a more dense urban village, small town like Tissue in Belgium. And, uh, and it, it, as you were seeing before, the house Kersen showed is a house full of rooms. Actually, there we had uh, 16 or uh, 18 identical rooms. This this one deals also with the idea of a room and how big it could be, how small it could be, uh, but in a different way. Um, um, th when the clients asked us to, to build in this context a, a weekend house, we were really uh, amazed, meaning that the, the context is quite depressing and they had a little house there, but they are not 
let's say, poor, so they could buy a house in France. Uh, so we thought that would be a real weekend house, but they wanted it there in Belgium, and, and we were very, let's say, confused. But then, then, then again, the, the, the absurdity of the question made us think, why not, actually? Why could you not make in that context uh, a weekend house? This is one of the first collages we assembled, quickly made from... Um, elements we thought were inspiring and that gave a direction to the projects. The, the idea of a kind of certain hedonism combined with architecture, would that be possible on that spot? And that you saw in the aerial picture, but the, the plot is actually a very long plot. It's a plot that is, um, well, this is the existing house, the street is here, and there was a little carport here, but actually it was endlessly built out in a garden that goes until here. And our idea was to, first of all, take away all these build-outs that typically happen in Belgium, all during the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, somewhere in the back. And um, to, to start from scratch, leaving the little original house as almost a little silo of spaces, but, but not concentrate mainly on that, but the start from scratch and to, 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 to turn, let's say, the garden into the real house. The garden being the back of the project, and I'll go back, and actually by just, this is the wrong button, yes, making four identical rooms in there as being uh, rooms made by garden walls. This is something we could do because it was a garden. And somehow establishing four rooms as an enfilade, one after the other, four universes of, let's say, how you could live weekends there on that spot. The, 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 the section is very simple in the sense that you can see, it's very confusing with the buttons here, but the, the original house is this one on the street. And, and then you get a s sequence of, of, let's say, this four rooms, and they, they're 10 by 10 meters, uh, making a 40 meter long house. But 10 meter uh, big rooms is, is, is quite a lot for, let's say, a room as a size in a house. So it's, it's, again, this issue of scale came up. So for us, it was very interesting to see how, how a house could behave as a set of four rooms, where it almost suddenly took inside the house uh, certain elements which were actually outside so this roof you can oh, again sorry this roof is uh, the only one that is really fixed there's a roof which is actually sliding between the first and the second room as a kind of um, convertible car uh, uh, roof or house and the last room has a has a very standard garden in it and this is a, a courtyard you could say a pool with a subtropical garden and what i could call a kind of atelier like house and in a sequence this is how the house endlessly uh, is used and and it can shrink and become bigger depending on the seasons this is uh, the summer situation let's say where you have the the pool open air the court is, let's say, covered with this sliding roof. Then there's a sequence which is the main, let's say, covered space or the house itself. And it, it takes this uh, consequence, let's say, of a series of four rooms till the extreme where you have the entrance of the, the, the summer house next to the existing house in the street. So you see the back of the system with its uh, door and at the same time, when you enter the first room and you look back, you see that the system is just parked against the original house, which we, of course, cleaned a bit up um, in the street. The second room contains a pool, and, and for us, this is the moment also where it becomes really hedonistic, where you could, because of the sliding roof, cover it in the winter, and it, it can keep a, a subtropical garden. Uh, LA style, let's say, and 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 this kind of mediation of temperature, uh, in, uh, climate, intermediate climate, 
was interesting for us because the, the bathroom of the house is actually put in this room, which is in a lot of cases outdoor, but of course in winter becomes somehow uh, halfly indoor and in immediate relation with the, the next room. And this whole negotiation each time room by room is simply made by a, by a wall, each time repeated in the plan, r a room parked against another room with a, uh, a gap in between in which there is sliding big windows and doors that act so the windows are really main frames to look through. The doors are with a threshold and so on. You can see that in the pictures. This is the system as it ends in the last room. As you can see, it's a very simple garden brick wall that is painted from the inside. It has a system of a, a beam laying on top to finish it as a kind of a court niche. But in the end, it's capable of framing um, any uh, sorts of space. The first room again where there's a strange storage and a covered walkway from the original house to the weekend house. And here you can, by the way, also see that the, the roof is parked above the pool in this case, the sliding windows. And here we're already in the third room which is the main, let's say, living area. You can sleep there, you can cook there. There's a strange space dividing um, wall or device, a curved wooden wall from the outside just stained in grey, but from the inside dressed with a big leather uh, sheets. And then, so you can, it, it, it keeps this kind of very basic elementary way of living, also in the, let's say, the main part of the covered house, to then end up again in a very classical garden, which we called certain Belgian garden, but st still keeping that system of windows, of openings, of perspectives going on. And the last glass plate is a reflective glass plate that f reflects back the entire system of the house, but also suddenly shows that what was once the ambition of the project, let's say making a weekend house in this very uh, harsh almost environment, became possible by reframing what was already there, these huge trees, as you can see. And the back of the house, uh, where you can see the, the, the system again projected or, or reflected uh, inwards. So it brings us to the next project, which uh, in, in a certain way you could say is a slight jump of scale. And it's a bit of a haphazard collection of projects we're showing tonight. We apologize for that. At the same time, I hope, or we hope, it's illustrative for a train of thoughts. Ultimately, the argument is always the same. Even though an architecture, you might think uh, from the interior, and for us it has been a very fruitful uh, way of thinking it, it's of course never black and white. At the same time, if you think it that way, uh, what becomes extremely fundamental to design is that very perimeter, the threshold. So whether it is this perimeter between room against room in which, as David was just explaining, the sliding door is as it is hidden between two rooms, uh, or it is a house which literally shows uh, its back uh, to, to its immediate context, uh, when you enter, I would say, the realm of the industrial building, and here we have talking about an industrial hall, it is ultimately exactly trying to find in this 10% uh, a possibility for architecture. Because ultimately, of course, uh, there's not such a big difference. In a house, you can say you can uh, detail a, a bathroom, you can detail a kitchen, you can detail the very beautiful window, but you do not really design how people live in it. So in that sense, if you do, uh, in this case, I would dare to say literally a big box here for a kind of a um, um, pepiniere, which is something like a nursery for, for plants. It's a big company and one of the three big companies in Europe who um, kind of grow and then transport plants, uh, ultimately uh, you're designing nothing more than a very big container in which the plants you see here surrounding that building are put in that container for 24 hours to dry so that they do not rot during transport. 
So, in a way, you could say it is uh, a question to make a box in the most uh, box-like box. You know, and here you have an adresse uh, tool and die, one of his blue color series paintings uh, of the series which became later his Course of Empire in the American Pavilion, 2005. Um, ultimately, uh, this extremely simple depiction of a box-like building, uh, and in that sense, I must say, we really sympathize with the Gary box uh, Jonathan just showed before with the funny kind of spaghetti staircases. Um, for us, this, this box-like idea uh, was an unavoidable, I would say, paradigm. So when, when this, uh, this, this client, this person approached us to, to make a, a beautiful piece of architecture, he had uh, grand ambitions. Uh, he had been to Switzerland and thought that maybe for 5% more budget than he was normally planned to spend, he could make a very beautiful barn-like building to uh, dry his uh, trees and we said uh, forget it I mean it will be steel because the only thing you can afford and so it so it went <laughs> so at the same time of course you have to imagine a box like that he had asked for a price uh, in this kind of standardized companies and they make this insulated box um, and this insulated box can serve for many things and then somehow since wind has to go through to dry the plants they add some here and there some some kind of uh, um, openings, uh, some some grills, and, and then somehow the wind goes through, and that's it. So we had to somehow dismantle this idea of the box, rethink the envelope, and, and think of something where wind could go through totally, uh, and do it somehow with this little bit of budget more. So we thought, okay, if we also rethink the way you make the, the, the span, you maybe make one kind of slope, and so that when you approach the building from one side, you see on the left, it looks really like that box, and on the right, you understand it's slightly bit more sophisticated. So here you see that. Um, so in a way you could say two uh, straight corners on the one side, on the top, the straight corner seen from the street, and from the other side, that other corner which somehow gives the other perspective you just saw, um, which was entirely pragmatic because we knew that, and then we come back to that, uh, perforating the perimeter, allowing uh, the wind to go through, getting rid of all the insulation, and in that sense making the lightest possible envelope for such a building, of course also made the possibility that uh, rain would enter that building, which is exactly not what should happen. So we had to make the box a little bit bigger, especially on the side where most rain was expected. And so that geometry allowed us to, to tackle that, that problem. So here you see that in a way using a standard uh, laminated uh, kind of uh, beam uh, span but turning it upside down and then putting it into an angle allowed us to work within the logic of, of what normally would be there a beam and kind of turning it into our advantage. And then making indeed nothing more than a container, a container for exactly that what was outside. So inside and outside are trees. So here you see a collage as we made it at the time. Uh, where, which in a way for us settled uh, the perspective of what we wanted to achieve. So in a way emphasizing the architecture of the span, uh, kind of diminishing the appearance of all the rest of the, the perimeter, and then trying to work on, I mean, the performance, you could say, of its transparency. Um, what we were working with finally and what we were looking for and we used and finally for the building was a very, in a way, standardized material. It's this kind of corrugated steel uh, panel uh, which is perforated. You can find it in the industry, but it's typically used for insulation panels in, in bigger buildings and there's insulation behind and that's why it's perforated for sound insulation. But using it here outside with its biggest possible kind of span uh, made in a way uh, what you could see the, the facade. So the facade is everywhere the same, uh, on uh, vertically, but also you could say the facade of the roof. Uh, important here is, of course, how to resolve the, the gutter, because if you make these boxes, it's exactly these borders, like here, how do you, in a way, make the no detail here, which somehow we were able to, and also the no detail, you could say, of the corner, uh, which make this box uh, so, I mean, at least that's what we think, elegantly box-like. So the result is uh, a kind of ghost of a building, uh, a building which is indeed nothing more than a mediation of inside and outside, where nothing ever gets really kind of clear, and, and where uh, the, the decision to kind of put here and there big doors and there uh, here and there small doors kind of confuses the perception of am I looking now at a straight building from an angle or, or not uh, even more uh, potent. So here you see that. You see a couple of pictures. 
And you see that in a way, um, through uh, kind of uh, a simplification of, of that was possible, what was possible uh, with this extre highly industrialized uh, set of materials that we tried to reach this architecture. You see the beams inside, you see the lights on the beams, and, um, and you see the doors uh, which mediate that. So here you see you again. Um, it's of course again, as I said before, uh, exactly this detail uh, which somehow enhances the perspective. From inside, because of the perforation, the building almost looks paper-like. So again, an attempt to, you could say, um, search for an architecture in a place where there's almost, uh, in a way, nothing to find. Um, to get back, of course, to, to that kind of um, particularity um, of uh, a building which only exists because you would like it to. So you paint uh, these columns in the same color as the span, they kind of make the span, but the other verticals which have to work um, to, of course, to, uh, to deal with the wind uh, forces uh, are part of the color of the facade. So the next project is um, it's a house, but in a strange way, it's, it's, it wants to be as thin as, as the, the drying hall you were just seeing that was shown by Kerstin. Um, a house as a perimeter. This is in Spain, in, um, near Barcelona. Well, actually two hours drive from Barcelona. Uh, in a Materaña, uh, near Horta de San Juan. Uh, an area just one hour away from the sea, from Tarragona. And um, a beautiful area, actually. Uh, it's um, a natural reserve. And, and actually next to that natural reserve, our client, um, Christian Bourdet, a guy from Paris, he uh, bought an enormous amount of land and, and has this dream to develop a project together um, with 10 ten, ish architects, I, 10 or 11, I, I don't remember, to, to, to make that area into a, a set or almost a collection of houses. And um, he, he is um, asking that question to each of the architects he invites. He says, look, um, if you th would think of a secondary house, a holiday house, what would be your take on that or your dream even? Uh, and, and he took us to that spot exactly. Well, it's from the air, it's not that clear, but anyway, it's a dirt road. It's kind of remote as a natural area. It's a beautiful area quite hilly and, and with mountains and so on. And, and, and he said, look, Kersten and David, this is your spot. Uh, there, I would like you to think of a house, a secondary house. And then, first of all, we are very amazed by the beauty of the nature around us. But secondly, we, we started an understanding our site, which is actually a, a plateau. You cannot see that here, but a plateau, kind of empty, with surrounding views, amazing. So a bit lost on this plateau, we started walking around. And finally, maybe that walk made, made the house how it is uh, today in construction. The idea of a house as a, almost a perimeter that could uh, measure a site that is quite big, uh, and that just as, a, as this part we did is very thin, that was really interesting. This is a picture that has been sent by uh, Bas Prince, a photographer of which all the photos you saw uh, we always work with. He said in this picture, and it's like, is the house not like that? And we said, yeah, probably. And this is a plan <laughs> where you can see also, um, not that clear, but anyway, the height lines. So actually, the terrain drops immediately. But, but so we just made a, um, the house as a perimeter, a circle of 45 meter diameter and a, a ring of four and a half meter wide as a roof that is actually embracing that entire plateau. And under the roof, under the ring, exists a house in different parts. It's a house, a circle and a square. The square are lines of columns holding up the roof, but also defining four different quarters of house under it. The 
lowest quarter is actually a sort of a living room kitchen area. To the right is the bedrooms, some bedrooms and a library in the middle. And the top is a bedroom, study, etc. And to the left is an uh, open house, which is uh, the pool house, because there's also a pool. And as, as you can see in the section, the, the edge of the house really mediates with where the landscape drops down and where you are actually looking at the amazing views around you. At the same time, it embraces an interior which is exactly the same nature as surrounding you, only a certain flat area that suddenly becomes, just by the act of making the circle in a strange way different, it becomes domesticated, although it's exactly the same. And these are the first collages we made to uh, explain to Christian our project. And as you see, it's this idea of where is the inside, where is the outside, how does it mediate with the views around to the beautiful nature? How could a house become almost like a, a line? And, and at the same time, a very realistic um, take on it. I mean, how do you make a house? How could it be carrying a roof, uh, columns, a line of columns, of course, making that square plan. At the same time, a curved facade made in polycarbonate, dressed even still with stretch aluminum, that can entirely roll open. So the, the curved facade, you could open the living room entirely by the whole high house is actually a big rail, so you can slide it and open up the living room towards the views. At the same time, very simple glass in between the columns. And the columns are also a structuring device for putting the furniture, the fixed furniture. So the kitchen is hanging on the column, the bathtub, and, and some dividing cupboard. But it's, they're the only technical devices, presents, to, to, to hang on, let's say, these elements of life. And in a very strange way, this, because it's so remote, the area, each of these houses has to be autonomous in its uh, energy, in its how it um, has water, uh, how it creates heat. And it fascinated us. And I think that's something we, sh we, we really like as, a, as architects is the fact that it's quite a technical profession. So these technical devices that were needed for making the ho house work autonomous, so no gas, no water, no electricity arriving. We just somehow installed them on top of the roof, water tanks, solar panels, uh, batteries, generators, and the, somehow like in um, Unité d'Habitation of Le Corbusier, they become like sculptures uh, standing on top of this horizon that makes the roof. And this is the site where you can already see the, the crane this, uh, and, uh, and the edge of the, the roof. But first, when we came back, we saw this, and it was really funny because it was actually the, 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 the little tour we were making on the first site visit. It became almost like a road that was endlessly just turning in itself. We were walking back on it like that, on the road, going around and marking the, the position of the columns. The columns that then were put, these lines, uh, actually just following exactly north, south, east, west as orientation. And finally, the roof being put up. And from the roof, it's, it's, it looks extremely big. It's uh, gigantic. It is, of course, still a 45 meter um, diameter house, but but still, once down, it becomes again human, and and the size of the house is not that big because each of the inside spaces, all if you add them up together, they become we come to a sum of 270 square meters. But of course, it is a lot more generous, giving a lot of outdoor space, connecting these four houses all together. This is one of the quadrants where, where the bedrooms, for instance, will, become, will come. And at the same time, there's a pool, which is partially natural, so 
to the left and leaning in, to the right against the house. So the house is almost like a retaining wall for the pool itself. And it becomes, uh, you could say, a natural artificial pool from which in the last facade you see there on the left, there's a view again to the, to the surrounding landscape. That one will not be closed, that's the open pool house. And each of the open corners, because of the square being bigger than the, the circle, giving these big views to the surrounding landscape. So, finishing the small presentation here with the last project, is of course also trying to finish an argument. Um, it's an argument of an interior which uh, tries to take as much part or as much possession of a piece of territory, a piece of land, that it so much coincides with it that, you know, the way it inhabits, it's ambiguous. Uh, perhaps the house we just showed before, the solo house uh, being case of the point. Now, if you stretch this uh, on a very different scale, uh, I mean, a scale for us uh, entirely new and, and exciting uh, to, to deal with, uh, you, you come to this project. It's a project, a competition we won about um, eight months or a year ago, no, eight months ago uh, for the um, RTS, the uh, French-speaking radio and television for Switzerland in Lausanne, uh, next to uh, the Learning Center, as I guess a building most of you know, um, on the EPFL campus. Now, um, so here is the Learning Center, and in a way here is the site. Um, the site um, of, of this specific project, you could say, is kind of as big as, as the project is. And it was from the start uh, conceived in our head like this. Uh, very much, you could say, within the logic of um, the, the solo house, as you just saw before, um, we felt that a building uh, of, in a way, a foreign entity, I mean, French-speaking radio and television, uh, which is not part of, uh, of course, the education uh, of the campus of PFL, but at the same time, in negotiation with that campus, uh, should, at the one hand, take everything of the site and then leave almost everything free, you could say. Um, of course, there's many arguments uh, to do so. I mean, partly there was a, a train of thoughts uh, developed uh, by by the building of, of, of Sana uh, just next door, uh, which has to do with trying to kind of maximize the way of using I mean, the territory uh, as a kind of artificial landscape, an argument which has been followed uh, further uh, in, in, in a project here under construction currently called Under One Roof, um, which is also somehow trying to maximize the part of, of the usable space. At the same time, also, it for us, it was um, also making a very different building than that learning center. It's a building which, in a way, is a, a place for production. I mean, uh, people who work here, they are, uh, sorry, making, <laughs> making uh, radio and television, um, and uh, a place which could be used uh, by the campus uh, proper. So, in a way, as a reference image, we used uh, this this uh, this uh, picture, this this uh, painting by John Baldessari, um, which is this kind of square which negotiates uh, in its maximum geometrical effect uh, with an existing situation in order to to organize a, a bigger tableau, a bigger field. Now, the square in question here uh, we use as a reference for you could say the the rectangles or the squares which became part uh, of our plan. So uh, what are these squares? These squares, as you can see them here again, uh, which are these big kind of uh, volumes here, uh, are what you could call in French emergence, or kind of uh, something between a big box a a and a small tower. Um, our volumes, uh, which are on the one hand able to negotiate with the scale of the campus itself, I mean, they're uh, big buildings, uh, which are sometimes of extremely pragmatic uh, of type. I mean, they're like a very big recording studio for television, or one for radio, easily accessible by big trucks. Uh, they're um, something like a restaurant of the, of the bigger campus, or a mediatek, and at the same time, they're also almost like you know magnetic uh, 
elements or, or something like cutouts uh, on, the, on the main floor plan, which is the first floor plan, six meter higher, uh, where they seem to organize in one way or another the field, which is in a way you could say uh, a maximum interior, uh, which tries to take in a slightly smoother way. I mean, the question here is how do you finish something which wants to be endless? So we thought that was an interesting uh, possibility. So to round off the corners to the extent that you think it is going forever, because any cut would somehow feel too much as a as a disruption. So, of course, the evident uh, references here, uh, known to you all, uh, are either an attempt to make something like a non-stop city plan, but knowing that it's impossible to make that, and then, of course, a kind of Campo Marcio-like um, kind of uh, a congregation of, of many different elements, a kind of pseudo-urbanity, where each of the elements together make something like a space uh, for work uh, and a space uh, to study. So, so here you see a zoom in of the plan uh, as an attempt to, to, to get to a certain type of translation. And here ultimately you see how the building itself as a consequence of this train of thoughts uh, presents itself uh, on the edge uh, of the campus. You see also that this uh, ear shape like plan, as you saw it before, is to a certain extent a consequence of this existing building. So somehow we had to push in because this did not belong to the site, the building, and all of a sudden the ear like shape uh, is the result. So um, the building itself, of course, is a set of uh, volumes which carry this big plateau for production. Uh, the main floor where uh, radio and television is made. So it becomes a highly technical endeavor, you could say. The volumes have these big trusses, uh, the trusses hanging between the volumes, and these trusses organizing themselves the space, uh, the space of production. The volumes have these addresses, as you can see here, uh, in the campus, and become, of course, also the organizing pieces uh, of the building proper. So here you see both the facade drawing um, and the section. So the section you see that these boxes are to a certain extent sometimes quite hybrid. So there are big volumes which have sometimes this big recording studio and then the kind of auxiliary spaces around it. Or as you can see here, uh, a smaller recording studio with a kind of a blue key studio uh, and, and auxiliary spaces towards the, 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 the main floor, uh, the champ as we called it in French there, uh, the kind of uh, open field of production. And here you see then again how this kind of top lit uh, kind of big piece of cake um, is hovering uh, above the campus. So here you see obviously the construction principle of this. It's, uh, I mean, the result might appear uh, complex, but of course the logic is extremely simple. I mean, it's like trying to uh, put make big trusses from the most evident points, from uh, emergence to emergence, from volume to volume, in order to organize the space. Here you see the plan again, which you saw before. And you see, in a way, uh, kind of a perspective as we made it during a competition uh, of that space as it creates with the, the shed roof, and where actually the sheds plus the kind of stretchers plus the main trusses make the totality of this uh, eight meter and a half height of structure you need to span, uh, of course, between the big volumes. So here you see the ground floor, which is extremely important for us and extremely important for IPFL, so that in a way from the learning center onwards towards the UNIL, which is the other part of the university campus, you have this, I mean, open space in direct relationship with the production, but also you have an almost fire brigade-like set of cars uh, for reportage, like these typical radio and television cars, parked under the roof. And here you have a very big like, logistical center, which is protected from the rain few more perspectives as we showed them in the competition. As you can see here, I mean, and you see this in a way extremely pragmatic consequence of that space and the boxes uh, this, uh, which are in these uh, very big volumes. And you see of course here that detailing which also in a building like that uh, becomes extremely important. I think it's good to finish with a few pictures. I mean, a bit of like a snapshot where you see on the one hand, uh, you know, the building in its context uh, on the campus. And then here a few pictures from the presentation of that. I mean, the competition a few months ago where you see, uh, you know, the consequence in a way of, of this attempt to make um, an interior which is so big uh, that it uh, needs to be carried uh, with big force. And forgive us the low quality of the pictures, but we never had the time to really kind of uh, take proper uh, views.
But it gives an idea. So finishing with this, uh, I, we feel it's, it's right to round off and almost reconnect to Jonathan and his presentation. Because of course, when you make a building that big, uh, where of course the architecture uh, is extremely important in how it uh, can organize the space on the one hand and how it technically makes that space possible, you end up with a space where the furniture almost again becomes so fundamental uh, that it becomes indeed uh, perhaps the perfect playground of exactly that industrial negotiation uh, with uh, furniture design uh, as Jonathan just uh, presented it. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, for the ones who still want to stay and ask questions, please. <laughs> or oh, Jonathan. I had one question. <laughs> um, if it were, there's always, I've noticed in many of your projects, there's always a kind of relationship between um, mapping the space and the building itself. So, in the, in the solo house, you have these sort of um, squares. Um, which are identical and, and or sorry, and, and, and rather in the weekend house you have these identical squares and in the solo house you're orienting the house north, south, east, west and, and this becomes a, a visible um, diagrammatic kind of translation onto the building. I'm wondering sort of maybe you could tell us more about that. Well, I think it's also something which which starts to grow on us in the sense that I think when we started our uh, practice, we, we thought we were more abstract architects than we realized we are. In the sense that um, uh, you could say that with an extremely simple uh, geometrical kind of uh, preoccupation, you arrive at a place and you have to, of course, orient your intervention. And so, in many ways, uh, this kind of geometrical correction, as, as Enrico Walker once called it, uh, becomes uh, a vehicle uh, to take much of its context with it. So, um, I think we tend to believe that uh, the work is, is much about experience in that sense. So, uh, although it's, we often present it in an extremely abstract and, in a way, rather, uh, perhaps, a confrontational way, uh, ultimately, uh, we are convinced, and I, I think we both were very happy on how you, you introduced, although we didn't show any of the projects you mentioned, <laughs> neither the summer house or the, or the, 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 the notary office, that um, it's very much about the spatial quality of these places and how through, say, orientation and then at the second level through materiality, uh, it is able to, to communicate that. I mean, but that's, that's, I think, I think we start to talk about it more now than we used to. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this, I, this painting we showed of Edward Roche is maybe a good explanation in the sense that we are really busy with all the time trying to measure uh, space or, or life, even if you want. If even if that's not possible, you know, and 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 each of the projects has that attempt in itself as a kind of framing, uh, and 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 somehow we like to use very simple uh, architectonical tools to 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 try to do that to make almost a kind of a backdrop for for what is life and and in essence what is then probably again an infill with with even furniture because that's. For us, uh, architecture is not really a, a sculpture which stands somewhere and to look at, but it's rather a space, an interior, uh, that becomes a backdrop for, for life to develop. If I can play back the ball to a certain extent, um, I think what, what for us is very important is that uh, you make a decision and you take the consequence of this decision. You could call this composition or you can call this kind of very focused desire. It, it's what, or, or whatever you want to call it. When we were confronted with your work, for example, the chair, which we also have in the office, as you showed, 
and you talked about the chair. I was very fascinated by the fact that on the one hand you, you also did that in a presentation, plastic or, or, or aluminum chair um, or steel chair and how, how they are typically made uh, technically, how you try to make in a way one kind of chair with the other material. But also what you didn't explain so well much here uh, is that in a way the legs are very straight, right? And in a way only the shape of the... Um, uh, the seating is, is, it has a specific form and it's the combination of the straight uh, kind of legs and the curved form which in a way makes this complex, well complex, it's not very complex but a specific form of it. And I was extremely fascinated by that. Uh, it's to do with how you create a certain complexity with a minimum of means. So, uh, first of all I want to ask you how, you how you see that yourself and secondly I was wondering Working then with this producer of, say, Gary panels, as you just explained, I mean, I, simp I mean, if I can call it that way, all of a sudden you enter, and I mean, I, I like Gary, that's another discussion, but I mean, I, 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 I realize that in a way that in problem, which in a way design, made you design a chair, is gone, because yeah, they make everything out of a computer. I mean, you can draw this, you can draw that, so there's no rules anymore. And how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's an interesting set of questions because rules, and I think we saw it in, in your presentation as well, the, these kind of constraints, um, budgetary. Another thing I wanted to ask you was about budget, but budget and, and constraints, I, I love these things. I mean, they are so important, and, and, and the more of them, the better in a way. And somehow the, the aluminum chair um, was so dictated by these constraints. And one of those was that uh, weight. We knew Noel has had the Bertoya chair for over 50 years, and they know that 15 pounds is a kind of magic weight for outdoors. Producers that will make um, lighter chairs, oftentimes they'll, they'll put uh, solid steel shims into the legs to weigh the chairs down so that they're not knocking around and blowing. And, and somehow this weight was always with us. And so we, we would play with the design and, and we could measure it in the computer very easily to understand how much something's going to weigh. And then as we moved into prototypes, and one of the things that became absolutely essential if we were going to have a contoured skin um, which at first we thought of as maybe a, a one-piece kind of injection molded down to the legs, was weight. And if you would have cast that whole chair, including the legs, as one piece of, of material, you would have ended up with like a 23-pound chair. So we were forced into adopting a hollow extruded profile for the legs. And that, of course, opened up a, a can of worms in terms of uh, freedoms, because it could have been any profile. It could have been oval or circular or triangular or anything. And somehow, because the, the shape of the chair was such an organic, body, body-driven shape, you know, the lip on the back is intended for, for the kind of third glass of wine when you're sort of slouched back and the, the, the contour in the lower back is there for when you just arrive and, and you hope to sit up a little bit straighter. And so the whole thing revolves around the body and somehow the legs uh, have nothing to do with the body. They are just there to hold up the chair. And they are the, if you think of, of um, these kind of master sketches like Rembrandt or uh, Durer, you have uh, moments of a face which are, are illustrated in great detail and other moments which are just a, a quick gesture. And somehow we associated the legs with that quick gesture that they should just be these very simple, very pragmatic uh, things to the point that we started working with pre-made extrusions. Um, for economy of production, Noel makes their own extrusion, but it, it's basically a replica of a pre-made extrusion that we found off of the shelf. So, so we were able to then start working with a pre-made um, extrusion. And so the, the nice thing, as you mentioned, was that then that rectangular quality of the leg uh, in a way created a border for the organic quality of the shell and controls the shell in a way that it doesn't, let's say, escape itself. Um, um, and then on the other, the other project, which was the, the, this extrusion-based project, um, in a sense, uh, there are some real constraints there. So, so the, that extrusion can't be bent um, tighter than 48 inches, which is an, it would yield an eight foot diameter or roughly two two something meter diameter. So that's the smallest that curve can be. Um, the 
curve could be larger, as lar you know, soft or as wide as you'd want it to be. But there's a constraint in terms of how small it can be. And then um, the amazing thing with developing the, tech, the uh, web software was that we had the ability to determine how would someone shape this bench. And, and, and it could have been, I mean, if you would draw freehand, that's one thing. Um, but drawing in a computer is something totally different. And there we were able to impose. Um, we, start, we actually found, um, and it would have been a good reference to show, but we were looking for cons ways to constrain the curvature. And we found, uh, w you know, we were looking for other places where there exist these kind of curves. And we thought that maybe the architectural basis for curves would be found in a format. And the format we found was the Zen Garden. And we studied, we ordered dozens of books on Zen gardens and basically found uh, roughly 13 types of curves that repeat throughout these Zen gardens. And they're very simple. And they're all, almost all of them are arc based. They're not spline based. So splines are freehand. You know, for, I mean, maybe, probably Gary works more, than, more with splines than he does with, with arcs. But arcs are radial in nature. And so we developed the software to have uh, basically constrain the bench to a series of tangential arcs. So there's always, um, there's always a kind of radius involved in the equation and always a reference back to the circle and back to the basic geometries in the Zen garden. And, and so that was our way of sort of controlling what is really a, a, an open process. I mean, someone could probably intentionally make the weirdest bench. Um, but it reminded me of the, the nonstop city, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, and, and I, actually this was a reference for us developing the, um, the bench, was that you end, up, you end up with a whole family and variety of, of different curves. And, you know, uh, we ordered one for my house recently and we had it straight. So... <laughs> Um, Maybe the non stoppy reference, the non -stop reference, sorry, uh, f would bring me, and, and I don't want to monopolize the questions, but uh, would bring me to another question to you. When you make a chair, you make a chair, you make an object, you make many chairs together, and somehow you start to take in, uh, you know, a space like what you have here in this auditorium. Introducing this this uh, object like this kind of bench, uh, all of a sudden, and um, you make the association yourself. You you seem to engage in designing a space rather than simply making an object. Is this something which you're further investigating? Yes, I mean, I, I mean, I love the interplay. I think one without the other is you know there are industrial designers who go smaller and they make. I don't know, USB sticks or Bluetooth headsets. And this has never been something that really interest me, interested me very much. I'm always much more interested in the next larger relationship, which for furniture happens to be the boundaries of the space in which the furniture exists. So, I mean, the, the Vitra showroom was the first time that we worked on something that was, let's say, larger than a small room. Um, it's something I'm very interested in pursuing, but I don't know that I, I, would, I would be building, making buildings. I think I'm just more interested in pursuing the relationship between um, space and the things that we, we sit on. Can we maybe try and open it up and see if, um, if there are some questions, please? Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a, a question specifically to uh, David and Kirsten. Uh, I see a lot of similarity with your work with uh, early OMA work. And I don't know if you take it as a compliment or as an offense, but uh, I guess what strikes me is that like there are so many similarities. First of all, like in the, the, the result of your, your work has the kind of similar uh, kind of irony of uh, irony, so some level of cleverness, some level of invention, that kind of uh, similarity in the work, the similarity of the, the methodology, uh, the similarity in both the way you've named your offices, uh, OMA's Office for Metropolitan Architecture, your office, uh, and also uh, you come from European uh, background that are very invested in American culture. Um, but one thing that I find quite strikingly different is that Kulhas had to sort of predicate his entire uh, sort of oeuvre of work based on this very big theory called this metropolitan experience and delirious in New York. Um, while you have, you don't necessarily have this kind of big manifesto, or at least none that I can exactly tell. Um, 
yet you produce very similar kind of work. And for me, who are very invested in kind of the importance of theory, uh, become shocked when you can produce the le same level of caliber of work without the necessity of theory. Um, so my question is like, will you, would you write a manifesto or, or do you find it necessary? Do you find that something that's not necessarily important anymore? Uh, that's my question. I, I just give a very short answer then I leave Kirsten, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was explaining to Jonathan uh, just before when he was uh, tr uh, trying to find how to introduce us that the, the, he was describing uh, the, our first project, which is the notary's office entrance. Uh, and, and in a strange way, it's also kind of a mythical project because you cannot really visit it and so on. But it was a, a project when we were asked to build a table, but finally we made an, an entire interior made out of glass in a windowless space. And, and a lot we say that this is a sort of a build manifesto for ourselves. Uh, it's the first project we made and as a, as a project it's, it's something that comes all the time back. It doesn't mean that. But we started with a build project and maybe that's very important. So the, the idea also mentioned by Jonathan that things are materialized is, is kind of important in the office. It doesn't mean we don't um, write in architecture or think it's it's but the the, the both extends let's say building and, and 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 thinking architecture are extremely important for us i am only allowed a short question by motion so i do it very short <laughs> because of course it could be very long as well um no i, I we believe architecture production's core value is its ambiguity uh, we think that its oblique character is, is the core of it. So if you say architecture is itself, which is not something we invented, you have to believe that uh, the fact of claiming without consequence, which is in a way the consequence of its cultural position, is its essential value. And that's why we believe that the projects themselves should be able to make this claim. That does not mean that we do not believe in theory. On the contrary, we do not believe in propaganda in the sense that you write something and the building, the project has to illustrate your thought. We write a lot, as a matter of fact, in San Rocco or in any of the other kind of uh, devices we have invented to write. Um, but we do not think that uh, that writing should have a one-to-one -one relationship with the production because if you would do that, it kills the production proper. Can you um, talk a little bit, um, because this is the first Rouse visiting artist lecture series, so I think just in order to fulfill at least the terms of the, uh, of, the, of the lecture program, it would be good if we can also spend a few minutes just talking specifically about art and how uh, really both your practices touch on that. Because it seems that, you know, Jonathan, when you started talking about for example, the, the, the manner in which you use certain kinds of colors or the way in which you're dealing with the concept of collections in the way that you organize both exhibitions, uh, the one that you, uh, you did with the kind of collection of works from other people and then with the chairs. And I think in the, in the practice, the use of photography, uh, the kind of reductivism of the drawings, the very simple line drawings, there's a kind of nihilism of, you know, at, of course, with this project, you're entering representation much more explicitly in some way. But I think with the other ones, there's a, there's a very specific way in which you use image um, and the relationship between image and the production of the project, uh, which is what you said about making. Can you both just talk about the role of art? And then we're, we're at least done with that part of the uh, thing. And then maybe I think Inyaki has some question for you. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we look at material all the time. I mean, I think it, the title of the exhibition, Source Material, says says it all in a way. I mean, I think we... we, we mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we. I spend, obviously, Donald Judd has been a massive influence. I mean, he, I think there's furniture before and after Donald Judd. And, and I think as a designer working anywhere, but particularly in the United States, you have to deal with Judd somehow. 
um, uh, you know, on your own terms. I think someone in, at the time either said you can, you can go around, you can deal with, or you can go straight through Donald Judd, but there's only those three options. Um, and I think in furniture, uh, there's, that, there's that. And I think the first project I showed Smith, which is made in a folded sheet metal that, that is really, um, was Donald Judd's favorite material was, obviously this was very much um, present. Uh, color, I mean, actually the color, something we didn't mention, uh, a shared reference um, is, is this uh, Ed Ruscha, um painting uh, of, the, of, the, of the house with a pool and, and somehow the colors, we took the colors from the aluminum chair almost directly from this painting. Uh, a bigger splash, it's called, and, and this is a, a painting that uh, was on the cover of the book that, that Kirsten and David gave, gave us. So the, the, there are these references that I think of them as, as kind of uh, stepping stones or, or blocks, and, and I spend a lot of time, I think probably at least 50% of the books in my library are art, art, art books. Um, so. Yeah, well, to complement or to, to complete, uh, for both of us, and I mean, Hockney, Roche, and uh, let's say uh, these so-called Los Angeles-inspired artists, often European artists, and if not European, then at least part of the European scene, like Baldessari, Roche are of course American artists, but they're part of, we feel very much of a European scene, despite the fact that they're based in Los Angeles, uh, have been extremely important for us. Always in this ambiguity and how they embrace and how they somehow also are slightly a bit repulsed by, by the very you know context where they, where they operate. But I think for us, we are not looking at these same artists the way people were looking at them in the 70s or 80s, but I think we, in Belgium, we look through this, uh, to these people uh, through what happened with uh, post-conceptual art practices. So I feel that um, you know, the way you look today at Roche, you look through that uh, after you know, conceptual art has passed, after uh, landscape art, mineral art uh, has passed. And I mean, you look, I mean, we have a lot of uh, artist friends, in fact, in Brussels, uh, and, and you cannot anymore uh, take them, let's say, naively. You know, it's like uh, Roche, you first look at the little books he made, and you understand that books are maybe more important than the paintings, and then through the books, uh, you start to understand the mode of production, which has to do a lot with framing, uh, with sequence, uh, with uh, eliminating certain things. Um, and I think it's this kind of confusing relationship with reality is found, where you kind of find a sublime in almost nothing, um, which we find extremely uh, uh, important. Uh, and of course, then we, we can we can talk much more about these. But uh, despite our say knowledge of architecture, I think art. Is, is more important in the way we talk to each other than, than, than architecture proper. Mm. Right, just to fill on that is what Jonathan was saying about the, the power of the constraint. I think that's a very important thing for us too in the sense that I, I th you could say in art that's very, uh, it's a powerful tool too. Uh, any artist has its own constraints and works uh, radically with these all the time and repeats himself all the time. But but uh, we we use, as you also mentioned, these collages as a certain um, limitation or a constraint that helps us to think more uh, freely or abstractly about how to make projects or how to think projects. And the same with the plan and the same with uh, even models we make. They're, each of them are separate products. And as, as a body together, they could explain a project, but they can exist on themselves. Yeah, it's very important. As opposed, no, but as opposed to the 3D render, which you take snapshots from, which is maybe a perfectly valid way of working, for us we have two perspectives to show, and they're the only thing we know about the project. And so, uh, since you only know this, you develop this. It's like uh, the idea of composition here is literally an attempt to gradually develop something while making more. Uh, so each product is an end product and is the project as a whole. Which is very close to what I would feel like art practices do it. Mm. Okay. <laughs>
Uh, no, I, I would like to, to make a, a comment. I don't know if it is a question or not on, on, on your presentation. First of all, thank you very much. I, I know that it's an effort and it's very difficult to present when you are two, when you are three, it's even more difficult. So, so, <laughs> so it has been like, like very interesting to see how, how you organize the, the talk and to, to create the, the image of a kind of, 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 of dialectics or dialogue. But, but, but my, my point is that uh, I'm not so sure that, that your talk, especially, I mean, I mean, your talk was very clear and very to the point. I don't think that your talk was exactly on interiors. And in fact, I mean, this is what I want to, to, to discuss a little bit because it's too late. No? So, but but uh, uh, I think it could have been titled perfectly exteriors. I mean, uh, uh, and, 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 and I say this because uh, when I look to your interiors, uh, the images of interiors, some of them are like more, more um, how, how can I say, it, refined, but basically all of them are trying to avoid the notion of interior. They want to be exterior. Or this patio that is this cover that goes up to, from one patio to the other, etc. So the, and also the, the way you finish the interiors, the kind of bricoleur um, um, this attention, in a way, to the refinement of detail. Everyone that talks about interior, in a way, tries to create like, like integral finishing of, of the, the space or, or a kind of three-dimensional. And in your case, it's, it's very casual, in a way. Uh, and there is a kind of lack of interest in detail. And, and this is what I call about bricolet, no? So the, the, let's say the skylight is a skylight, it's an industrial skylight. The railing is there, the block of concrete is there. Uh, maybe you paint a little bit of white to homogenize, but but there is not this kind of, of quality or, or uh, let's say refinement in detail that, uh, and in fact I think there is a kind of distance from from this kind of attitudes of refining the details, and and I'm uh, interested in 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 this uh, approach and especially in a moment that you have shown just one second, uh, one uh, slide of, of the interiors of the house, uh, one house, one villa of Picasso, uh, with all the disorder of the, of the uh, he lived with and he wanted to live with and that was so important, has been so important for many architects, including myself, but also Enrique Miralles. I remember quite well how many times we were commenting on these images. No? And, and I think that it, it, it was a, cue, uh, a kind of key to understand what is your approach that you have tried to eliminate it. And I don't know why, <laughs> because the quality, maybe because the quality of the photography was not so good. No? And, and, but I want to finish just this, uh, this comment, uh, talking about uh, as, uh, San Rocco, and a text that has always uh, intrigued me, uh, that I see the hand of, of, of maybe your, your, your hand, Kirsten, but I'm not sure, which is a, 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 a text, an editorial text called Indifference, uh, that talk about uh, the need of indifference in architecture, that we have to, do we pay too much attention to things, and that indifference is, in a way, is, is the most needed thing that the panorama in architecture has nowadays. And, yeah, and the, the, the article uh, ends, if I remember well, saying that uh, uh, indifference is exactly taking care. So the opposite to, to what it, in principle, uh, mean, uh, means. And, and I mean, this is really paradoxical, but, but I, seeing your work and seeing, I remember in this article, I think that there is a, so, I mean, there's a meaning for this, which, uh, I mean, in a way, I think that it's very clear that you don't want to project too much of yourself, I mean, you too, in, in the work. You want to maintain a distance, and, and, and this distance is given you by patterns and types that are just borrowed, I mean, taken and put on, on play. But, and, and you leave them operate by themselves, and instead of taking too much care, you know, with a kind of indifference that creates a kind of ambiguity. This is my comment. I mean, Yaki, it's so hard to say something intelligent after this. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, of course, in, in various degrees of, uh, with various degrees of emphasis, I think what you say is, is correct. Um, of course, 
as every architectural production is ambiguous, uh, in some projects this is more consciously there, and in some other projects it's maybe less consciously there. I mean, but maybe to answer in the shortest possible way, to do most in, uh, in favor. Um, um, Interior is, is of course more of a provocation uh, than, than a real, I uh, would say, state of intent. Uh, and I, I would agree with you. It's like you start with there where we imagined uh, Jonathan would, would, you know, would bring us, <laughs> and then you dismantle it to a point where, in a way, there's no interior left. And for that perspective, it's a bit like the cover of the book um, of, 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 of uh, Rainer Bannum, right? With, uh, with, uh, with a picture, painting of, 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 of David Hockney's uh, Bigger Splash. It's something like a window to a hypothetical world. Uh, and I, I feel that our interiors want exactly to be that. Uh, and that has, of course, a lot to do with the fiction, we believe, is, is the core of architecture. You always want to live in a place which, to a certain extent, does not exist. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful evening. Thank you.